around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. We'd like to take the opportunity today to welcome you to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It is Monday. It is June the 10th, 2019. I trust you had a very blessed and beautiful weekend and that the Spirit and the grace of God touched your heart and touched your life powerfully. I do want to make mention we have the Age of Deception Conference DVDs completed. They're now available to whosoever will. Uh, we're asking for a love gift of $50. That's postage paid. And there are 10 DVDs in the series. So needless to say, that is an awesome, awesome uh, blessing uh, price-wise in the context of just $50 for 10 DVDs. As, a, as we always say here, we're not in it for the money, but we do have to cover the CDs, the albums, the postage, and all of those things, time for post-editing, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but we're just trying to get the truth and the gospel of Christ out to everyone. The interview that I did with Hugo de Garris to me, was far superior to the presentation he made in the conference. I got him back there in the green room, and as a layman talking to a professor, to a scientist, um, I got him to speak on your and my level um, so we could understand about the technology. This stuff is growing exponentially, and the church regretfully sits in darkness. And one of the reasons the church, the nominal church as we see it, continues to sit in darkness is because they're purveyors of their denominational issues or ideas or ideology. They wouldn't bring a man like Hugo de Garris into their church. <laughs> they won't even bring somebody like me into their church, much less Hugo de Garris. But if you're not preaching or teaching, espousing their dogma, their doctrines, their tenets, then they have nothing to do with you. It's isolationism. They cut you off. They don't want anything to do with you. If you don't go their way, they have nothing to do with you. This is, this is how cynical. This is why uh, it almost becomes occultish. And, and I say that with, with respect to each denomination. But they almost become occultish because if you're not like us, you're not even saved. That is so self-righteous. That was the issue with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were profusely uh, self-righteous in their tenets. And that's what happens in denominationalism. So the Age of Deception Conference DVDs are available to you for a love gift of $50 postage paid. And there are 10 DVDs in the set. I think you'll be immensely, immensely blessed. You'll be blessed by Russ Dizdar's presentation. You'll be blessed by Jimmy D. Smith. The message he preached on Saturday morning was absolutely awesome. That's a message you want to hear when he told about the boa constrictor, how the lady uh, inherited it. She didn't really want the snake, but it was somebody uh, that she knew who had passed away. So she took the snake. And uh, uh, after a while, the snake got out of its glass cage and uh, would get on the bed with her, coil up. Uh, then it began to shed. Then one, one morning she woke up and the, the, the snake was stretched long ways beside of her, stretched out long ways. So she calls the veterinarian. She says, I, I think there's something wrong with the snake. And she went through the litany of things that had been happening. He said, lady, get that snake out of your house. He's measuring you. 
because he's getting ready to devour you. He's getting ready to eat you. And he's seeing if he can ingest you by stretching out his body long ways to see if he's long enough to consume you. Friend, deception is a reality. And don't ever question it. Don't ever question the power of deception. It is real. It is genuine. It is bona fide. And it will affect your life and affect you powerfully. But the sad story is deception can affect you for all eternity. I brought out in the teaching on Friday morning in the conference, I taught on deception. And I shared how that in Revelation chapter 20, after the devil has been loosed out of the bottomless pit where he's been for a thousand years. Now think about this. He's been in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. You know what the first thing he does when he's released? He goes out to deceive the nations. A thousand years chained, a thousand years in captivity, and I would not dare say without a doubt, he was in total darkness for a thousand years. But as soon as he gets out, what does he do? He goes out to deceive the nations. So after all of that, his nature has not changed. His personage has has not changed. Who he is and what he is never, ever changed. That is profoundly, profoundly tragic. So again, the DVDs, there are 10 in the set. That's a lot of DVDs, but I know you'll be blessed, especially by the interviews in the green room. And of course, uh, as I said, for a love gift of $50, that's postage paid. That covers all the expense. You'll get the DVDs of the conference. So I hope you'll avail yourself to them. The, the quality is really superb, and you'll enjoy many, many hours of watching and listening and hopefully learning from the Word of God. Again, let me remind you of the DVDs of the Age of Deception Conference. $50 love gift, postage paid. There are 10 DVDs in the set. Also, I want to go ahead and give you these dates. April the 16th through the 19th, 2020. We're going to have the conference rescheduled for next year at the Hickory Metro Convention Center. We've done booked it. The conference will be entitled Power Failure in the Church. Power Failure in the Church. Um, most everyone is already scheduled to be back with me, myself, Russ Dizdar, Steve Quayle, Jimmy D. Smith, and, uh, I got a question mark. I maybe have a session just for the women, just for the ladies. So we'll look at this. I'm not sure yet, but if we don't do that in this conference in 2020 of April, April the 16th through the 19th, we're going to do a conference and give the ladies a chance to minister to the ladies. Now, we're looking at two other locations, Rome, Georgia, and also Evansville, Indiana. I'm looking at those two locations as well. I'm going to travel to look at the buildings because the number one thing that people liked in the conference were the altar calls. Now, in Branson, Missouri, there's no room in front of the stage for an altar call. The seats come right up to the stage, so you can't have an altar call. So I have to personally go and look at these buildings to make sure we can have altar calls because people want to come and seek the face and the presence of Almighty God. So those are the other two locations presently on our agenda, Rome, Georgia, and Evansville, Indiana. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, those are going to be scheduled uh, because I feel the need to go and share the gospel of Christ to all the world and as many as possible. Um, so go ahead and put down next year, April the 16th through the 19th, 2020, same venue, Hickory Metro Convention Center. Registration is the same thing, $100. We're not going up. We're not trying to make money. Uh, we've learned a lot through this past conference where to cut in our budget, uh, how to streamline it, how to make it better. And we're probably going to do away with the evening session 
the evening session because it's so taxing and we go 24 seven. We don't stop. And I, I just feel like in my heart, it may be best to leave out the one session and just do a little bit of reorganizing and give you the very, very best that we can through the grace of God in our lives. So put that on your calendar, the theme for the conference, the theme for the meeting revival is going to be power failure in the church, power failure in the church. And the reason the church is struggling is because it has pushed Christ out and they have been purveyors of their own, um, their own ideologies, their own mindset, and not the things which are our Lord Jesus Christ. When you get away from Christ, you're absolutely getting into grave trouble. Well, today, as I said, is Monday, June the 10th, 2019. This is the 17th program of this series. We've been talking about the church or denominationalism, the church or denominationalism. I'm going to be on the side of the church that Jesus builds, not that which man builds, but that which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ builds. He's the architect. He is the, the chief engineer. Christ is everything. And he said to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And this is so, so true. We were talking last Tuesday about priority was still being given to the Gentiles. To, excuse me. Priority was continuing to be given to the Jewish people and not the Gentiles. God was still reaching out, reaching out to the Jewish people, trying to bring them to the saving grace and the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. So when people will say repeatedly, I have said it, but I was wrong. You know, this is the great thing about being a true child of God. Confession, confess your faults one to another. I was wrong because I was only repeating what I had been told. I was only repeating what I had heard. The church was born at Pentecost. That's error. The Bible says in Acts 7.38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. You see, when you understand the church is his body, Abraham was already grafted into his body. Genesis 15 and 6, because he believed. Because Abraham believed, it was counted unto him for righteousness. When you finally get through all the strongholds of denominationalism, and you realize that all it takes to be saved is believing You'll start breaking the chains, the shackles, and the fetters that hold you hostage in other areas of your spiritual life and walk with God. Genesis 15, verse 6 is clear. And he believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him for righteousness. What did he do to be brought in? He believed in the Lord. Then, of course, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church was already in process. I will build it. Already fundamentally there, and he's building it. How does he build the church? He adds to the church daily such as should be saved. It's like adding another two before, another two by ten, another floor joist, another truss, uh, another footing. This is what God does. He's always building the church, the body of Christ. Revelation 3, verses 11 and 12. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. So God's building the church, and he's making some people pillars. That was used of the apostles. They were pillars in the church. So when you hear people make the statement, 
the church was birthed at Pentecost, no for a certainty. That's not factual. It's, we're talking about Jews. We're talking about Gentiles. That's why I, I get so disturbed when people say, you have to do this to be saved. And then when you say, like the, the thief on the cross, well, he, he, he didn't get water baptized. He didn't do any of those things. Matter of fact, as I shared last week and the week before, he didn't say he repented. He didn't say, God, be merciful to me to a sinner. He, he didn't say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. He said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Now, there would be those out there who would say, well, there's no way he could have been saved because he didn't repent. I'm telling you, the older I get, the more mature I get in the Lord. I understand more things, and so should you. But some people had rather embrace denominationalism than embrace the word of God. He didn't use the word repent. He didn't say, I'm sorry, I'm remorseful. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he said. Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. A lot of denominations would say he was never saved or that was before Pentecost. When you understand the Holy Ghost, Pentecost, that dispensation has nothing to do with a man getting saved. Abraham got saved. Abraham got saved. Why? Because he believed and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, the book of Acts, it's called, if you look at the front of your, in your Bible, if you look at the, the front of the book of Acts, it will say Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts is a great display of the works and the deeds and the things that the apostles did relative to miracles and gifts, signs and wonders, as was promised by Christ before his ascension. Christ promised his apostles. By the way, these are all Jewish apostles. Only the Jews gave us the Bible. That angers people. That upsets people. But Jesus said in John 4, 22, salvation is of the Jews. Romans 3, verse 1, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Every time you hold your Bible up, sir, and you say, I preach the word of God. You're preaching a book written solely by Jewish men. And no, those men were not replaced by the purported church. There's no such thing as replacement theology. That is man's corrupt ideology preaching replacement theology. God is not done with Israel. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you believe. You don't know what you don't know. You don't go deep enough to know the deeper things of God. You cannot read Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14 and believe that God is through with Israel. You cannot read Romans chapter 9, verse chapter 10, verse chapter 11. You can't read these chapters and, and believe that God is done with Israel. You can't. Unless you're ignorant. And of course, some men choose to be ignorant. They just, they'd rather be stupid and dumb and ignorant than to come to the knowledge of the truth. First, excuse me, 2 Peter 3 and 18 says this. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But grow in grace and in knowledge of Jesus. It doesn't say grow in grace and in the knowledge of your denomination. That's not what it says. It says grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you're too busy growing in your denomination. And that tells me you're growing wrong. You're growing wrong. You're being taught wrong. You're being led wrong. The blind lead the blind, the both fall in the ditch. 
That's 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 a that's a a funny statement that Christ would say that the blind man says to the blind man, "Let me lead you. Let me show you where to go. Let let me help you walk the right way." <laughs> The blind, leading the blind, Jesus said, if you do that, both of you are going to fall in the ditch because neither one of you know where you're going. The greatest liberty I ever received in my life other than salvation was when I turned in my credentials and I left the denomination because I was denominationalized. I was denominationalized. It was their way, and of course they say their way is the only right way. But after I got out, and even before I got out, I began to see the error of men and their theology. See, I began to see, b before I ever got out, the pre-tribulation doctrine was error. And because I saw it was wrong, they came against me vehemently. Oh, I still love them. I, I wept and prayed the other day for the Church of God denomination out of Cleveland, Tennessee. I prayed God opened their eyes. Isn't it amazing how all the prophets, and I'm not saying I'm a prophet, don't misunderstand me, but isn't it amazing how all the prophets, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, they prayed for their nation, they prayed for their leadership, but the leadership says, Jeremiah, you're wrong. The leadership says, Daniel, you're wrong. The leadership says, Zechariah, you're wrong. But the truth was, they were not wrong. The leaders were wrong. You see, just because you have a title, I'm the general superintendent, I'm the general overseer of the church of God, or the, that, that doesn't mean anything with God. Actually, that's not theocracy, that's democracy, but we believe in a theocratic government where God is in control. And isn't it amazing how all the religious denominations always fight the men of God when God raises up a voice and says, thus saith the Lord, oh, get rid of that guy, he's causing us church problems. See, I'm a problem when I preach and teach like this, I'm a problem to all denominations, not just one, but all of them. Why? Because it's not right. It's not right. It's just not right. So when you preach in their area of where they're in error or wrong, they dislike you. They, they hate you. But this is the tendency. This is the proclivity of man and his mind. You see, Peter was struggling profusely. How in the world can the Gentiles be saved? How in the world can the Gentiles get the Holy Ghost? How can they be saved just like us? That's why God gave him the great vision in Acts chapter 10. The net coming down with all these beasts. And he said to God, I've never put any unclean animal meat in my mouth. I've never done this. And God said, what I've called clean is clean. And they struggled. Why? Because of their personality, how they had embraced wholeheartedly and rightfully so up to a point, the Mosaic law. See? Then here comes the dispensation of grace. And Peter, he's tore out of the frame. He's struggling. He's grappling. He doesn't understand how God could save Gentiles, Samaritans, heathens, pagans. How, how can God do this? God said, because I'm God. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. God says to him, what God hath cleansed, call not thou common. He's talking about the souls of men. He's not talking about pig meat. He's not talking about pork. He's not talking about pork chops. No, he's not talking about sausage. He's talking about men, Gentiles. God said this and did this to him three times. Isn't it amazing how Peter denied Christ three times? Jesus questions him, how much, how much do you love me? 
three times. You know I love you, Lord. You know, he was negating the three times he denied Christ. Then here in Acts chapter 10, he does the same vision three times. Peter's like a lot of preachers. He's hard-headed. God has to hammer it into him. But see, God knew when he got it to him, he would stand firm and would preach the truth. And would preach the truth. And then we have our first church council meeting. We have our first church council meeting in Jerusalem. And you know what the subject was? Circumcision. You see, Peter and the apostles early on says, you know, you, you got to be circumcised to be saved. But see, they came to the truth that you don't have to be circumcised outwardly to be saved. It's the circumcision of the heart. But the Jewish denominationalism was preaching, you've got to do these things if you're going to be saved. But that's not true. In Acts chapter 15, Verse 6, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that for a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Hear the gospel and then what, how do you get saved? You believe. And God, show, and God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. In other words, because the Gentiles believed, they received the Holy Ghost. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Your heart is not purified by water. Your heart is purified by faith. Folks, read your Bible. Quit listening to what these jack legs are telling you. Quit listening to them. The Bible says their hearts were purified by faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Quit listening to their jargon, for God's sake. Understand, God's given you the same Bible that they have. They just take it on themselves to Lord and then privately interpret the scripture and say, no, I know that's what it says, but that's not what it means. So they reinterpret it. They reconstitute it to say something that it never meant for it to say. So Paul, Peter says, these men received the Holy Ghost just like we got the Holy Ghost. Gentiles. And God put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Did you get that? My faith and what Jesus did on the cross is what purifies my heart, not anything that I do. It's what he did. I just have to have faith in what he did, not faith in what I did or what I do, but faith in what he did. Let's go on. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Here's, that's what denominations do to you. They put a yoke on your neck saying, now you got to do this. This is what you got to do. I don't believe it. You'll never get me to believe it. And I'm not going to listen to any more of denominational teachings. I'm done with them. Because all they do is try to, in an, in an occult manner, indoctrinate your brain into one element and that's their belief according to their denomination and thus everything else is wrong it's not true you see these men grappled with this denominationalism as well that's what that's why they're having this this general council in jerusalem they, they come together they say we've got to talk about this stuff we got judaizers who've been born again who've received the holy ghost but they're still running around saying you've got to be circumcised Here's the wisdom of Peter. Therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You see, a denomination is going to put a yoke on you just like an ox. 
And they're going to say, you're going to plow this way. You're going to go this way. You're going to go that way. You're not going to do it how the Bible says it. You're going to do it how we say you're going to do it. That's what they do to you. It's what the Catholic Church does. Some denominations are more Catholic than they're willing to admit. That's right. They're a harlot. They're a mother of the harlot. Or excuse me, she's the mother of harlots. And these little strumpets, these little Protestant strumpets run around and say, oh, we got the truth, but yet they got the same type of garbage in them. Now watch this. Acts 15, verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. We shall be saved even as they are saved. The Gentiles are being saved, guys, just like we are saved by the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, when you do a work, that don't save you. Now, you've been taught that saves you, but that don't save you. That's contradictory to the word of God. That's being denominationalized. They've brainwashed you into this, this. And here's what's so tragic. I had a lady wrote me a letter. I read it this morning. Are you going to marry queers? <laughs> that's, what she, that's what the letter asked me. You, I feel insulted that you would ask me that. You don't actually believe the way I preach, I would stoop that low to do that? We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, they, the Gentiles, shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return. And will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set up, set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So every Gentile that calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be saved. Every person is saved by believing. Acts 10, uh, excuse me, Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, what does it say? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Period. Paul did not add anything else to that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call on God, God, I'm sorry of my sins. I repent of my sins. I, I'm a cheat. I'm a liar. I, I do drugs. I fornicate. I'm an adulterer. I'm an adulteress. I'm a drunkard. God, forgive me of my sins. And you believe you're saved. You don't have to do anything else. Now, I know there'll be others who'll tell you, no, 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 no. You're not saved yet because you got to do this. You're preaching fallacy. You're preaching false doctrine. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, you have to rightly divide it. You just can't take a verse over here and say, now, I'm going to build a doctrine on this one verse. You can't do that. That's how heresy gets started. No. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. You can't pick and choose and you can't, 
I've always been taught you have to have a minimum of two scriptures to establish doctrine. See? And the message was to the Jewish people first. Romans 2, 9, tribulation, anguish, sorrow to the Jew first. It's coming to them first. The great tribulation will begin in Jerusalem. It begins with them. God began to move. God began to do signs and wonders. God honored his word that he promised them in Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. God confirmed the word with signs following. Now, this is why it's important to preach the Word of God. You must preach the Word of God without compromise. Then after the Holy Ghost had been poured out on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, again, the Jewish men, women alike, received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Now, God is authenticating, validating, proving Christianity is now going to fill and complete what the law could not do. See, if that, that's why people who go back to the, their purported Hebraic roots, that, that is such a, that, that, that's such a sad and sorrowful thing. That's what the Galatians did. That's what the Judaizers were preaching. Galatians 4, 9, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, where ye desire again to be in bondage? Remember the, what the word again means? Do that again. In other words, repeat it. Again means repeat it. Do it again. Do it again. Repeat it. How turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements where ye desire again to be in bondage? So many people in denominations are in bondage. Let me go back where I was quoting from Galatians chapter 4 verse 9. But ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul said, I, I don't want my work to be in vain. But you scare me. You frighten me, you Galatians. Why? You're going back to the law even though now you've been saved by grace. You're going to try to keep the Ten Commandments. Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do. What does that tell you? That tells you plainly the law couldn't do what needed to be done for you so that you could be saved. The law couldn't do it. Why do you want to go back and keep the law? That's what the Jewish people are still doing today. And like Peter said, we, we couldn't do it. And now you want to put this yoke on them, these people, these new converts. You're trying to do the same thing to them. And even our fathers couldn't keep the law. Why do you do this, Peter says? Why do you denominations want to put a yoke on the people's back and make it so hard to live for Jesus? Let me finish the quote. Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Weak, anemic, impotent, powerless. God, sending his own son, and the likeness, not he was sin, but in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. I want to emphasize the word there. In the likeness of sinful flesh. He was not sinful flesh. He had no sinful flesh, but he was in the likeness. Why? Because of his humanity. Therefore, that was the similitude, the likeness, or quote unquote, figure. That is a figure of speech. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and 21. It is a, or excuse me, 2 Peter 3, 21. It is a figure of speech. Figure of speech. Be, be careful around that guy. 
His temper is so bad he might fly off the handle. You ever heard that? He might fly off the handle. Well, that happened in 2 Kings chapter 6. The young man was chopping a tree. The axe head flew off and went into a pond. Flew off the handle. Uncertain where it's going to go. Uncertain what it's going to do. So now we see Jesus is telling the people, I am that bread from heaven. I am that water of life from heaven. So Jesus anoints the apostles with the Holy Ghost and with power, and they're doing signs and wonders. Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Peter and John went together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. That means it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 6 o'clock was when the first hour began. So 6 o'clock in the morning, you add 9 hours to that, puts you 3 p.m. in the afternoon. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seek Peter and John, about to go in to the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He thought he was going to get a quarter. He thought he was going to get a dollar bill. He thought he was going to get a tip. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered into the entered in with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I shared that little rhyme a few weeks ago that I made up back in the 80s when the Hunt brothers were trying to corner the silver market. And I made this little rhyme up of the modern day church. Silver and gold have I some. Wish I could do for you what Peter and John done. You remain here and you remain lame. I'll be back to tell you my profit and gain. I made that up back then because I was was mocking all these prosperity preachers. It's still apropos for today. Silver and gold have we some. Wish we could do for you what Peter and John done. You lay here, you remain lame. We'll be back to tell you our profit and gain. That's the modern church. They have no power. They have absolutely no power. They have no Holy Ghost. You got to have the Holy Ghost to have power. You got to have the Holy Ghost to have power. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 1. Acts 5 and 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy. To it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. You know, I, 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 I have to say this. I loathe people who lie. And people have lied to me many times. Christian people have lied to me. People who have radio programs have lied to me. That's okay. I know the truth. Peter knew the truth. They sold the land for 10000 but they said they only sold it for 5000 Peter said, hey, dude. It was yours to do with whatever you want to. It, it, why you want to lie about this? He said, Satan has filled your heart. Satan has filled your heart. Satan has filled thine heart to lie. When you lie, listen to me, all you people out there who lie, Satan has filled your heart. When you lie about anything, Satan has filled your heart. That's right. 
And Adrian Rogers, God bless his heart, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Adrian Rogers said, when anyone tells a lie, they're no more like the devil than when they lie. No, no man, no woman is more like the devil when they tell you a lie. Because the devil was a murderer from the beginning, and he lied to Adam and Eve, and there is no truth in him. John 8, 44 says he is a liar. When he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And the father of it. Satan fathers every lie. Don't ever doubt that. Don't ever question that. When men lie to you, you know who they're their father is. John 8, 44, Jesus said, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is a liar. He's a master liar. And men, regretfully, and denominations, will lie to you. I've had denominational leaders lie to me. I've had pastors, I've had ministers lie to me. Just just lied to me. Just just told me lies. I I don't want to live like that. I don't want you to live like that because it is wrong to live in that fashion. It is wrong to live in that manner. Acts 5 verse 5. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young man arose, wound him up, carried him out, buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after that his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yea, for so much. Did you sell the land for... 10,000? Yeah, sure did. Well, excuse me, sold it for 5,000? Yeah. The truth was they sold it for 10,000. And Peter said, it was your land to do with what you wanted to do. The, the money was yours, but you lied about it. You came in and told us another number. Now, that, this, this is powerful, folks. This is, this is how God looks on lying. Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for 5,000. She said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all, all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Man, I thought we lived under grace. We do. Grace is powerful. Don't ever question that. Don't ever wonder about grace. I've, I, I've said it once. I've said it a hundred times. Grace is a higher standard than the law. Did you know that? Grace is a higher standard than the law. How do we know that? Under the law, you had to actually have physical contact and commit adultery to be guilty of it. Under grace, Jesus said, if you so much as look at a woman and lust in your heart after her, you've committed adultery already. Is that not a far higher standard? A greater standard, far greater standard standard. Sad, tragic, but a reality. I hope and I pray, and we're going to conclude this tomorrow, but I hope and pray you have these through these last eight weeks that you have learned a vast amount of knowledge about the church or denominationalism. I pray that you've learned that denominations will put a yoke on your neck. They'll harness you to a false doctrine and they will drive you like a yoke of oxen. 
They will drive you. And if you don't line up with them, they'll amputate you. They'll cut you off. They'll do away with you. Or like me, they'll bring charges against you and try to throw you out. But here's what I love about God. Did you know God didn't let that happen to me? God protected me. God spared me. God watched over me. I gave them my credentials. God never let them take them. You don't beat God. You don't defeat God. And when men are willing to suffer for the truth, and that's what I was willing to do. You see, when you get the revelation of anything from God, not men, you will stand and defend it to the death. Galatians 1.11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I didn't get this from a man. I got this from God. God gave this to me. That's how I got it. And so it is today. So it is today. And we'll pick this back up. We'll finish this series tomorrow. Then we're going to start a new series on the deprivation, the degradation, the debasedness of mankind. And then if we, after we get through showing you scripturally how evil, vile, wicked, corrupt men are, we're going to talk to you about repentance, redemption, restoration, reconciliation, and of course all that's based on salvation. That's where we're going to go next. That's how I feel led to go. But we're going to talk about the the sordid depravity of man. Man is so depraved. He's so depraved. And that sin nature is so prevalent. It, it, it is so pronounced. God wants to set us free from that. If you haven't gotten your DVD set, please order it. Go online. Write us. $50 love gift. 10 DVDs in the series. Again, the green room interview that I did with Hugo de Garris was so overwhelming. It was over 40 some minutes. I interviewed him longer than anybody. That series and that one interview is worth the set. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.